Welcome to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast, brought to you by the Wealthy Speaker School. This is the podcast dedicated to people who want to speak more as a way to build their income and grow their business. Well, welcome to the Wealthy Speaker Show, everybody. I'm your host, Jane Atkinson, and I'm excited to have one of our favorite guests back today. Welcome, Jason Hewlett. Hey, Jane, I am so happy to be back. I love your show. (laughs) We are going to have some fun today because guess what the title of our podcast is? (laughs) Yeah, you tell me. I can't wait. Here we go. It's Judgment Pivots and Do-Overs. That is the conversation of today. And let's just do a quick little recap of our last podcast because that's so essential to the framework for what's happening today. So during our show the last time you and I talked, there was so much juice on that. We want to make sure we put it in the show notes. But you had talked a little bit about your National Speakers Association influence experience that maybe didn't go as well as you would like. Talk a little bit about that just to refresh everybody's memory. Yeah, so this was a couple of years ago when I uh, spoke at Influence and I launched my brand new brand of The Promise as a keynote speaker uh, doing entertainment mixed in. And I received quite a bit of frosty feedback from people that did not think I was good enough to be speaking or had had need of their coaching while they're handing me a business card. And although I am a, I think I've been a member of NSA since 2003, mm-hmm. I was floored by the way that they were coming at me and it was, it was quite disturbing. And so I wrote about that in a blog post that went viral among the speaking community Right, the blog right. post was uh, called How Keynoting for Keynote Speakers Almost Killed Me. Wow. <laughs> and and uh, I guess that's a bit dramatic, but at the same time, I did not sleep for a couple of days because I gave pretty much the opening address of that influence in 2016 in Phoenix, and a few days later had to keep the secret inside that I was receiving the CPAE Hall of Fame. For speakers, and so I was terrified. Do I give them back the award? Do I? <laughs> what do I do about it? What do it? I do? You, yeah. you felt, uh, you know, a lot of people probably feel unworthy, even at the best of times. Yes. And then you had to go through this. Now, is there anything more about that experience that we should discuss before we move on to the redemption phase of our podcast? <laughs> because I feel <laughs> like I just felt, oh, I was so happy for you to be able to go back and just really show people. Um, I don't know. I, it just felt really great to me. I love a good do-over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I was um, so ecstatic that they would give me the Hall of Fame, uh, you know, honor. And uh, of course, being a full supporter, putting my children through their youth program. And I mean, I'm all in with NSA anyway. These are people I consider not just my friends, but like my family. And so I I thought, you know, there must be something here. Every, Every kind of criticism that we get, it's obviously the opinion of others, but we need to consider it to some degree especially the people that we respect. And so it did help me to take a real hard look at my direction. And that's when I knew I needed to firmly plant in the ground and go forth. And so, yeah. So for the last few years, I've been creating this new path. And then NSA nominated me, the Hall of Fame uh, people, when we meet, they nominated me last year to be the Master of Ceremonies for the CPAE Hall of Fame banquet, and uh, and which is where they give all these great awards out. And so they said, we want Jason in Denver 2019 to be our MC. I said, oh no, I would, I've been on stage <laughs> enough, I'm okay. And they said, you're the guy, you do it. <laughs> and so yeah. then I thought, what am I gonna do that they haven't seen? And as we talked it through, uh, I was asked, to visit my roots as Jason the entertainer from Las Vegas, where I started my career as a 
Legends in Concert Music Impersonator of Elton John. And right. NSA asked specifically, can you do Elton John full costume, the full act? I, I thought, man, I haven't opened these costumes for three years since I kind of have set that aside and become the speaker guy and rebranded to all my peers and my whole business. And I thought this is a big sacrifice to kind of step back in time and have them see what I kind of don't do anymore. Right. But I thought this is worth it to give them this moment and to share something that would be very unique. And, uh, and so I came up with a little plan that involved using my face and using <laughs> my, <laughs> my, Literally. my ability. Yeah. My ability to quickly grow a gigantic beard. And I thought this would be a great way to showcase what the promise and my message is regarding our promises to our clients, what we're willing to do for the bit. And so that's beautiful. kind of, I guess, how to tee this up. Is that a good spot? Oh, that's beautiful. And so, I mean, you committed, boy, did you go all in and it was so incredibly impressive. Now did stepping back in time, to do your Elton John, did that feel like step putting on an old pair of shoes or slippers or something that was very comfortable for you? Because, you know, one of the ironic things I think is that when people go to do the NSA main stage, and bo by the way, both of us are huge, massive fans of the National Speakers Association. And I think I've attributed it pub publicly that everything I know is due to NSA. Um, and I'm NSA. totally with you. And, I am my, totally in. And my friends there. Um, so when people go to do uh, main stage presentations there, though, they often will step completely outside of what they normally do. And it becomes very uncomfortable for them. Whereas you did it almost polar opposite of what's normal. You were trying, you were, you had a new presentation. How, how long had you been get, delivering that new presentation for? Oh, do you mean in 2016 when I did the promise speech? Yeah, the first one, yeah. That was the maiden voyage, Jane, and that's where I made a huge mistake. Ah. I, I should have been working on it for months or years, but I thought this is my chance to show my speaking peers that I am a speaker. I do right. have content. I'm not just the entertainer guy from my past life. Right. And, and obviously a lot of people that were very influential thought it was great, but a majority was like, yeah, that was not that good. And obviously a, a maiden voyage in front of, you know, 1,500, yeah. 2,000 speakers, bad idea. So. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the time to be trying on, you know, that's brand new material. Um, so I, I just, I'm so happy that you got to do the do-over and step into some of your older shoes. Now, I actually know for a fact that you could have come back and done that exact same speech and killed it just because you had had more time with it, right? Um, however, that's not what we were doing. You were going to be doing a uh, host of the awards banquet night and you just knocked their socks off. So talk about this commitment to the beard and what the beard was all about. Explain it again so that people really understand why you grew this massive beard and what were some of the comments going in? Yeah, you know, Jane, the more I think about it, it was sort of career branding suicide in front of my peers to be thinking, first of all, I want them to think of me as a keynote with content who's entertaining, not the other way around, an entertainer trying to fit in a message. Right. I want that. I want them to see me as a keynote in the keynote slot, and yet here I am hosting. Which I really, if you look at my website, I have taken most of all of that off as an option. I right. only have a couple of clients left, like the Million Dollar Roundtable, who bring me back all the time. Right, and, and so that's been grandfathered in. And then for them to say, "Can you do some entertainment pieces?" I thought, "Oh man, I am, I I am making a big mistake here, but <laughs> it's worth it." because these are my peers. I want to show them something that nobody would probably be willing to commit to. So right. I started growing. I actually always have a beard and my beard has been also a serious point of contention for those that have tried to book me through the last two years saying, hmm. look, 
you know, to have a beard, to, to, to look older than you are and these types of things. Now that it's kind of got some gray in it, it would be better if you didn't have the beard. So it's already this point of contention with people that were trying to get me gigs. Mm. And, and, uh, and because I do have a very malleable face and it's a big part mm. of the shtick. And so everybody's like, why the beard? Why the beard? So this is already a kind of a thing that I've been going through for a few years, Jane. And I said to Bill Stanton, the genius who is oh, a 29 yeah. time Emmy award winning show producer right. and was receiving that night as well. He was receiving the hall of fame CPA honor. So and deserving. We, so deserving. And, and we're sitting there talking through it. I said, yeah, I'll do, I'll do the piano man and we'll rewrite it. So he wrote the words. It was killer. We did the, the CPAE, you know, award thing. And then, and then I said, then it would be cool if I do the Elton John piece. What if I grew my beard to extreme lengths and shaved it off on stage? And he said, <laughs> you would do that? <laughs> and I said, well, sure. It's worth the moment. You know, it's worth proving to our peers that all those things that we say, like, I have to be the person with the hat. Or I have to be the person that always wears purple, or right. I always have this one story, or whatever. All of that really doesn't matter as long as the essence of you comes through. And and so we've created this bit around this concept that hey, all of us, all of us go to extreme lengths. If you're a Hall of Fame speaker, you go to extreme lengths. And we made fun of people like Mark Sanborn. So we were like, <laughs> you know, Mark Sanborn, the, the great, you know, the Fred Factor and the Hall of Fame speaker, he gets a full body wax before every presentation. <laughs> His clients don't even notice. He just does it because he's a Hall of Famer, you know. And, and like, you know, and for Trisha Fripp, that's, where did that crazy accent come from? She's not even English. She's from the Bronx. <laughs> You know, and, and so we, we put it. on this concept that n none of it really is what it is in the sense of we need to just be who we are and then we need to be committed to the right. moment and to that client. And so I came I out on stage, it. I played the piano man, everyone gave me a standing ovation because we rewrote mm -hmm. the words. I played the harmonica and the piano and that was great. And then I went into this story that the NSA had asked me to do an old routine from my Las Vegas days as Elton John. But obviously you can see that there is something very much in the way of me committing fully to doing this 100%. <laughs> what is my promise to my client? Not the one tomorrow, but the one now. What is my promise to them? It's to give them everything I've got. Even if it means changing what I've committed to for the last you know, a little while. And, and then I, I put on the uh, gear and I started shaving off my beard. <laughs> to the shrieks of the audience. They were screaming. They must have lost it because the alcohol would have been flowing pretty good by that point in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll bet and the they beard, just lost their minds. The beard was in its full glory. I looked Charlton Heston down from the mountain on Ten Commandments as Moses. I mean, I, it was it was furiously out of control, and I bushed it out extra big for the night in my nice suit. And I'll tell you, as I was shaving it, people were screaming, laughing hysterically, freaking out. And then I could go and say, "Hey!" Once the beard was clear, I said, "Looks like I'm ready to." commit to the bit and keep my promise to NSA. Here is Elton John. And then I went and put on the costume and did the Elton John routine. But I'm just telling you, this was a moment that people are now still talking about today, oh, yeah. months later. And I've been told it'll be something that they'll talk about for years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's going to go right down uh, in the history books with the Joe Calloway, let it go speech <laughs> and the um, Mike Rayburn hologram in my mind. <clears throat> oh, wow. Amazing. Well, wow. Amazing. And I, and we're going to, we're able to post the video of that on the show notes. Are we not? Oh yeah. My, my team and I came up with a video that explains a lot of what we did with this. Okay. It's about an eight minute video with the bits okay. shaving and my, my narration. It's Perfect. pretty darn killer. So yeah, we'll get that in okay. there for sure. Great. I love it. And I love being able to share. So 
I mean, what, why I'm so happy for you that this really went down so well was because you're all about commitment and keeping your promises. That is your new brand. And it's totally, don't you think that it's totally ironic that you had to take, you had to step back into your old, your old content in order to further the idea of your new content. Isn't that yeah. ironic? I mean, I don't, I don't know that we would ever suggest it or recommend it for anybody, but there's so much learning in here. Don't you think? Well, you know, you, you said that eloquently. I mean, that is exactly what we have to do so often when we think I'm burning the ships, I'm going forward. You know, mm -hmm. I, I can't look back. Well, a lot of the things that we leave behind is what got us there in the first place. Right. And I have so often tried to keynote without any entertainment in there. And it's a joke. It's like not even a good speech. But then when you say, <laughs> okay, how much entertainment can I put in? And the content is still relevant. And, and it's this fine balance. But to then have this be this bit with my peers. What's mm. interesting, Jane, is here I've been forcing this brand of the promise down everyone's you know uh, throat and in their eyes with the blog, blog posts and videos I do so mm -hmm. rampantly for three years. And I have still speaking peers that are like, I just don't get it. I don't get it. And it was like that night they all got it. it yeah. Like, I understand what you're talking about now. Wow. Oh, I just love that. And I love, I love the new brand. I feel like it's so important for people to hear. Did you say to me on the first podcast, apologies, my memory isn't that great, that you are really uh, focused on male audiences? Did I hear that yeah. right? You know, I don't know if we talked about that in the podcast, but yes, that is a huge focus. I, I think because in the sense of women naturally already have an affinity to this concept of promise. Right. And that's, that's a big word for them anyway. For mm -hmm. men, I think we just don't recognize the importance of that word. And we, we steer away from it and say, yeah, I'll just set some goals and that's enough. But mm -hmm. what about those bigger promises? And so, yes, men focused, leader focused, uh, business owner focused, family man focused as uh. much as possible. It's a, just a beautiful, beautiful message, and I love it. Now, I know you got a lot of lessons from both of these performances, and um, let's talk a little bit about how you deal with judgment, because I know the beard going in, you got a lot of flack for that, you got a lot of judgment for that, and you, I think you wrote about that too, didn't you? I did. I wrote a two-part blog post about this whole this whole thing that we're talking about here. So it's way cooler to have, have everyone listen to it than have to read all those long blogs. However, <laughs> what, what, I, what I learned is a couple of things. Of course, the, the concept that people are surprised as to what lengths people will go to to create one keynote or one special moment. Mm -hmm. And so often we stand up on stage and simply deliver that which we've practiced a million times. And that's a great thing to get to. However, how do we keep it fresh for ourselves and our clients? Right. And then the other, the other flip coin was that here I had this beard that was annoying a lot of people in the, ter in the sense of I am a bit of a public fi figure online at least. And mm -hmm. when, I, when I go around in my events and people were looking at this beard growing from a normal kind of handsome Hollywood look of a <laughs> short stubble. <laughs> To then, into, yeah, 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 to, to, yeah. to then turning into, yeah, to then turning into like, uh, well, what's Grizzly going Adams. on? Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and then by the time I got to Grizzly Adams' length, people were going, <laughs> he has lost his mind. In fact, I had, <laughs> I had peers at NSA. Obviously, they had no idea what I was going to do because only right. Bill Stanton knew, right? And only my family knew. I had to reveal to my family about a week earlier. I said, guys. At NSA, I'm going to do this bit. They didn't know either until a week before. Oh, wow. Um, and so, and my wife thought it looked fine. She doesn't care. She yeah. thinks it's great. Um, I had people coming up to me at NSA, very good friends, and then others just sort of strangers or acquaintances. And they were asking, so did you buy a convertible 
<laughs> with this beard, with your midlife crisis that you're having. <laughs> and I, I can take so much of funny because I am a funny fellow, you know, pretty much. But I, I think within the funny, there is a lot of tragedy and vulnerability and fear of allowing for authenticity or even just as an artist stepping out on that wire when you know if you're like a philippe petit on on walking across the world trade center that he did back in the 70s you are stepping out on that wire and you don't know if people are going to accept it right they're going to like it they're going to criticize you and that holds so many artists back from writing their book giving their speech recording their music and this was just another piece of art that's what i felt this was where mm -hmm. others thought it it was me losing my mind right it, it went from this i'm committing to a bit that no one knows about and it's going to be epic to a social experiment on the kindness of people not knowing the backstory and what they judge us for right right and 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 so what if i don't look like i normally look Yes. Will we still have the same conversation? You know, how does that alter the conversation? And, and I do have to wonder, you know, myself personally, had I run into you, could I have not made a comment about it, right? It was as plain as the beard on your face. There it would, have been, would it have been so difficult to not say something, a comment? And I don't know what comment would have been okay in that circumstance. You know what I mean? Of course, right. And, you know, that's where it became this social uh, experiment Fair. for me to think, right. What would I do if someone was going through something and I didn't know? Right. Or how could I support them without offending them? Right. Um, if they're making a transition in their career and they go from, you know, driving a, driving a Ferrari to now driving a, a lesser car, if you will. Now, how am I judging that when I see their mm -hmm. change or their change in style or their change in their speech, because right. I like their old speech, but I hate the new one. How do right. we approach that with people? And with this compassion. Now, how right. do we approach that with compassion? How do we say, hey, is everything okay? Like maybe it's just different questions that would allow us to get to our idea of I'm here to help, you know? Totally. Yeah. And I don't know what the answer would be, but I do know this. There was, there were very few people that could even talk to me without bringing it up. And obviously speakers, we have our, our boisterousness or our, our hilarity or whatever it is that makes us unique enough to get on a stage and be willing to be vulnerable in front of all these people. Mm -hmm. And yet when we approach a peer, especially someone else who knows what that experience is like to go from being adulated under the lights in front of thousands to then going to the darkness of a hotel room alone. Right. And, and having no one for a, another night, you know, now you're just Mr. Lonely. Well, right. th this was, this was this place that I, I was expecting would be safe. And instead it turned into kind of this judgment piece once again. And so how are we compassionate? How are we kind to those that we interact with, regardless of how they look or what they've chosen? Because we're now dealing with people that are going through extreme situations and challenges and transitions in their life. Right. And, and, and whether it's relational or it's mental or it's emotional, whatever it might be, how are we treating these people? Right. It really shifted my perspective, Jane. Like I looked at it and I thought, when have I done that to people? Like when have I been accidentally mean and judgmental? Oh, <laughs> you know? I'm sure we've all done it. I'm sure we've all done it. And, you know, it, it kind of makes me think about, well, am I really a good friend? You know, yeah. if so, it's it's got me thinking about all kinds of interesting things. Um, right. I have a question that's kind of going to take us down a little bit of a different path, but it's all interrelated. And that is, 
how much does confidence pay a role, play a role in your business? Confidence. You know, when you have been up, 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 high, high, high after a great gig, when you've been low, low, low after not a great gig, how talk about how you get back to the place of confidence well that's heavy i i I'm love sorry. that question no. <laughs> <laughs> because you know i even though i'm this guy who talks about promise and what are your promises to yourself and your family and god and all these things i also am like how confident really am i and because you know jane heavens i've come off stage even just of recent where I was doing a three-day event as the master of ceremonies. Day one did not go well for Ooh. anybody. The, the, there rough. were just a few things that were off. The speakers mm -hmm. didn't bring their game. I, right. was, I was not my best. I hadn't slept well the night before. Yep. Now, is it, is it now I go back to the room and I have got to get up quick for tomorrow because it starts again, same group. Same people that are expecting to see greatness. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it is it confidence that's shaken, or is it simply that that was a performance, that was a one-time thing? I brought what I could. I didn't nail it. Now, how do I come back to uh, the place of confidence? Right. I would say I would say that that's where you really have to determine what your promise is in that moment, and that's. That's something that you have to just sit there and say, well, am I, am I thrown in the towel? Like, do I call the client and say, I'm not good enough. This is over. Right. Or here, here's what I did when that happened, Jane, I had done the event six other times with this client. I went back that day, went back to my hotel room, sulked for about 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then I turned on <laughs> every video of every event I had done in the past with them. Oh, and, and I and it was like twelve hours of footage. I just sat there and watched it till about midnight. Wow. And and I took notes and I redetermined all that I knew I had that I could do that would be better from what I did that day. And it built back up this well of I have an arsenal of of you know of greatness that I can bring. Why did yeah. I not bring it today? What was missing? It wasn't, it wasn't that I was lacking confidence that very day, right. but it was the fact that I, I just didn't perform my best. It's like the gymnast who falls on the, you know, on the Olympics. It's just right. one of those things. It doesn't mean you're the worst person in the world. <laughs> right. But and you, it's you just, very easy to see it spiral though, isn't it? So you go back and on day two, what happens? Oh yeah. I mean, day two, I came in guns blazing. I was ready to go. And it, it, it was almost as if I had refound myself wow. and it, it transformed the whole event. And so then I looked back on day one and thought, Oh, was that my fault? <laughs> 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 well, you know, but it, it, it was it the client that you've done many, many years in a row. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so it could be that you came in with um, a level of comfort that, yeah. you know, maybe that was a little bit of the issue on day one. But one of the things that I want to mention to people is that what you talked about going back into your well of video, that's like your attaboy file and having an attaboy or an atta girl file that you can just kind of flip through testimonials or something that you know is going to bring you up in a time because this is going to happen to everybody. Yes. And, and when you have to go back out the next day, I would say what you did that worked was you focused on serving them and not yourself. Totally. You went yep. through those tapes and said, what worked? What did they love? Why did they love it? And you analyzed that. And that was a really cool thing to do. When you flip it around and make it about them and not yourself, it takes you way out of your head because your head can really play with you in a time of, you know, setback. Totally well said. And, you know, that first day, you're right. I came in with a level of comfort, but also a real level of confidence thinking, here I am seventh time. I got this. Yeah. And, and then, you know, you just kind of, you're just hitting a bunt. 
rather than swinging for a home run right. and serving them really well. And I would never think that I would just show up and not do a million percent, but I guess I just kind of accidentally did yep. thinking I was giving them my all and I really hadn't prepared like I should have. I should have watched all those videos for weeks prior and right. created something completely spectacular. And so it continually brings me back to my promise, which is, is not necessarily for me a level of confidence, but rather it's just what is my decision to show up and at what level for that client every time. It, and that may be you, the way you just defined your promise is how am I going to show up? Yeah. Yeah. Right? How do I show yeah. up for my family? How do I show up for my clients? You know, that's a really good lesson for speakers to be thinking about. And that's really, I loved our first conversation and I'm loving this one even more because I just think that everybody needs to remember that it's not about you out there. It's really not. It's about them and their experience and how are you a conduit to, get, to getting them to feel something. And can I take you to another piece of this, Jane? I, sure. When I, when I did day one at this client event, and I, I could feel when I was done, I could feel like this event, uh, this might be my last one. I, mm -hmm. I feel like they didn't like me that much. Right. It was that kind of a weird deal. So I went back to the room and watched all the footage. And then I, I, it was confirmed to me the next morning on day two. Right. Yeah. Yes. We are not bringing you back. Oh yes. yeah. It, it was confirmed to me because they said, you know, we, we never bring anyone back a second time, let alone seven. Right. So yeah, we do need to find someone else. And I was like, Oh, well now it gave me even more confidence to take that risk, to go for it, to give them way more because I had been holding things I think a little bit back that first day thinking, well, gosh, if they bring me back time eight, nine, and 10, right. what am I going to have left for those? I, I don't know what stories I can tell or what bits right. I can do. And so I'm like, I'm like, it's almost like the American Idol contestant that, that goes on thinking, I'm going to save best song for last. Right. But then they you don't may not make it. Get through the audition. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Oh, that's such a good point. Wow. Uh, you have given us so much to think about. You and I kind of jumped through a few hoops to make our, our recording happen today. <laughs> Tell everybody what was going on outside your front door. Right as I started to call, right outside my office, which is the front room of our house, all of a sudden I hear just this shrieking, screaming machinery. And I look out the window and there they are cutting the cement sidewalk right in front of my office window and i went oh my gosh i'm running to the house with a ring light and a laptop and a stool to try to find somewhere to oh that's funny i think work. that's hilarious that's going to go right up there in the hall of fame with uh kelly swanson's dog biting her bum as we're doing our interview on our podcast. <laughs> Her dog well, didn't like it when she got on uh, on uh, Zoom, so he had, a, I don't know, I think he was from Skype or something. Anyway, this has yeah. been so much fun. Thank you so much for coming back uh, a second time to be with us, and I do hope that we'll catch up on an annual basis and uh, see how everything is going. Before we let you go, though, how is the new brand going? Do you feel like you have a good footing with it now? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I actually, that was part of the beard growth uh, experiment because I, <laughs> I went up into the mountains in Utah where I live and I, I locked myself in my motor home for three full days and, and I did not reemerge until my book was finished. I have been chewing on the idea for three years ah. and had, had tried to write a chapter or a section here. Nothing was coming together. And I just said, I'm going to go lock myself away. And, and so I wrote uh, 50,000 words in three days and yeah. came, out of, came out of this motor home with, you know, sardines in my beard. Like I had just been surviving. <laughs> I love that picture. <laughs> like, like Tom Hanks on Castaway. And I, I, was, I emerged with my dead laptop and I'm like, 
it is finished, you know. <laughs> so you're holding it up like a tablet. Oh, <laughs> like totally. Charleston has yeah, my tablets. <laughs> and instead of throwing my laptop at everyone, they, you know, I just I just came back down to Salt Lake City and I sent it off to the powers that be. My 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 whole message is finally coming together because I've been delivering it, but also because now I wrote about it. Yeah. And because I'm I'm having to put it into practice and live it, where I'm making sacrifices for family, or for business, or for myself, and what promises am I keeping to myself? And so it's been it's been a huge deal, and you know that that's why this whole thing about the beard and shaving it and peers insulting you without realizing they are, <laughs> and all of these things, it all came into this one moment. It was mm. so glorious for me to then stand up on stage and shave it off. And everyone was <laughs> like, are you kidding me? That was part of the bit. <laughs> what are you thinking? That that solidified for them that the message made sense because I was living it. Beautiful. Well, I'm so glad that everybody gets it now. And I'm so glad you came on the show. Tell us the name of the book so we can be on the lookout for it. Yeah, the name of the book will be The Promise to the One, which is The Promise to Yourself. Beautiful. And that is the beginning of a series of The Promise books, which will be I Promise to Family, Promise to Client, etc. I love it. Well, Jason Hewlett, thank you so much for being with us on the show again today. I love your work, and <laughs> I am so impressed with your podcast. I love listening. I listen multiple times in a row. To, to different ones and I, you binge I'm listen. Telling you, yeah, I, I do I binge <laughs> listen when I work out and I binge listen when I'm driving and I'm just telling you Jane the work you're doing is helping so many of us so thank, thank you. you and continued blessings to you thank you so much I really appreciate that and folks if you've enjoyed our podcast please let us know please leave us a rating or a review out on iTunes and uh, we appreciate you listening Thank you so much for being here, everyone. And with that, we will say, see you soon, Wealthy Speakers. Bye for now. Hey, thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed our show, you'll want to come and visit us at the Wealthy Speakers School, where we provide a proven roadmap for building your dream business. Go to WealthySpeakerSchool.com. And for show notes for today's podcast, head on over to SpeakerLauncher.com and click on podcast. I'll see you soon, Wealthy Speakers.